Okay, next up is Ruth Morgan. Uh, she's visiting us from London. Uh, the title of her presentation is Trace Materials on Footwear, Science or Ichnomancy, Apparel for Interpretation of Soil Trace Evidence. Thanks very much. And um, I'd like to give my thanks as well to NIJ and FBI for the opportunity to be here and to share some of this with you. So, um, ichnomancy, slightly odd word to put out there, and I'm guessing quite a few different things maybe are in your minds at the moment. It's effectively um, a mode of divination, so um, derived, di divining characteristics and analysis of a personality perhaps from footprints. And this has really come about by a lot of thinking that we've been doing in the UK. Um, an awful lot of different things have happened in the UK that influence um, the way we practice forensic science, particularly in the last year or so. And um, this paper is really about um, sharing with you some of those, some of the thinking that's come out of that situation that we've been in and how we can ensure that the way we interpret the analyses that we undertake is really good, robust, effective science that can be admissible intelligence and evidence rather than maybe veering towards this more divination at end of the spectrum. So we've got no intention of casting any dispersions on previous work, particularly there's been so many amazing pieces of work done on soil and footwear. Um, George Pop's been mentioned a couple of times in the last couple of days. But fast forwarding to today, just really highlights the problems that these kinds of analyses face to ensure that they are admissible and effective and good and robust science. So um, just an overview of where we're going to be going. I'll be really focusing on soils and sediments, and I'm going to give you a very brief overview of a technique that we've been using extensively, um, quartz grain surface texture analysis, which seems to be providing very, very helpful um, results. And then I'm going to be sharing with you the results of two experimental studies that we've done um, that deal with um, both temporal and spatial aspects of soils and sediments and footwear. And these really came about because we began to see that obviously there is an, a, a great deal of complexity in soils and sediments and footwear. And if we want to be able to interpret the analysis of those soils and sediments effectively, we need to understand what's going on, the complexity and the interactions between the two, both in temporal scales and also in spatial scales. Um, so we've heard quite a bit about soils already um, over the last couple of days. I've had a great time. Um, but a very brief overview, there are physical, chemical and biological components in soils, which means that they're incredibly effective ways of deriving independent lines of evidence from the same sample that can provide corroborative evidence. And they're highly transferable. They get absolutely everywhere. Um, as I'm sure many of you have experienced when you've been inappropriately garbed for a particular activity. Murray and Tedjo did a, a great book in the 70s, Forensic Geology, and they provide lots and lots of examples of where particular components that are maybe exotic or rare were identified um, that were indicative of a source site. They were found on a suspect on their footwear or on their clothing or on their um, mode of transport, and that provided very powerful evidence that um, an alibi perhaps wasn't what they claimed it to be. But the question is, what about when we get very, when those sort of distinctive exotic rare components of soils aren't there? And that's where we think quartz grain surface texture analysis comes in. So these, these are quartz grains under an SEM. You can see they're, they're quite large grains there. Um, the brilliant thing about quartz is, as, as all, many, many of you know, it's incredibly ubiquitous. It gets absolutely everywhere. And that means that we generally always have something like with like to compare. So there will be quartz at a scene and there'll be quartz on a suspect. So we compare the one with the other. It's also very helpful because it's got both anthropogenic and natural um, provenances. So we can start um, building up some interesting um, indications of provenance. So the way that we've been using quartz is by looking um, at a number of different um, characteristics, physical, morphological characteristics. Um, shape can be very, very useful. So it's a very nice rounded grain. And in contrast to that, um, 
a very, very angular grain. Now, even at that level, we can start making some very helpful um, indications. We had one case where a suspect was suspected of burying a body in a particular wooded area. He had very muddy shoes and was asked where he got the mud on his shoes from. And he said he'd been digging a hole in his garden. Perfectly reasonable. Um, so samples were taken from the garden, samples taken from the grave site, and samples taken from his shoe. And his garden had very, very angular grains in it, and the grave site had very, very rounded grains. And unfortunately for him, he had rounded grains on his shoes and not angular grains, so we could categorically say that his shoes hadn't got mud on them from his garden as he'd claimed. We couldn't exclude the grave site. We can also look um, a little bit further down in detail at the edges of these grains, and that can give us an indication of the environment in which they've been in. So this is, you can see the, the edge of that grain has been, has been abraded, and that's very indicative of a, of a low energy environment, low energy traction as that grain has been moved along. And the contrast to that is um, far higher energy conditions, much more blocky edge abrasion. We can also look at the kinds of environments that those grains have been in. This is a very, very indicative grain from a river environment. So there are lots and lots of, um, I'm not sure if you can see, but um, disorient if I there we are, um, these V-pits that are in disorientated um, patterns. And that's from semi-angular objects in free grain collision in water against one another. So that's very indicative of a river regime. And the contrast to that would be um, a grain like this, which has got lots of um, these sort of bruised, upturned plates. And that would be very indicative of an aeolian environment, a global sand sea. That's been very useful in the UK in the past. We don't have any big deserts in the UK, so when you get these, these are quite, quite distinctive. Um, we had a container that arrived in Felixstowe, and unfortunately, when they opened up the container, there was a body inside. The question was, has that body been deposited in that box since it's arrived in the UK, or was it there before it was shipped? The body was covered in these grains. The, um, or the, the original um, source of that crate was West Africa, and we were able to say those grains definitely haven't come from the UK. They're consistent with West Africa. The police were very, very happy. They sealed it back up and sent it back for them to deal with. <laughs> So, so that's, that can be very useful. We can also start telling in particular pockets of a particular environment. So for example, um, this feature here is produced at a very specific um, collision speed. And that means that we can start excluding certain areas of a global sand sea from being the source and, define and refining down and down and down to more specific areas of where that grain might have come from. So um, Andy Byrne very kindly mentioned the paper that we wrote in 2006 yesterday where we outlined a forensically um, relevant classification system for these grains. And you can see here that we um, start at the sort of the broad scale on shape and we've got um, angular, an angular grain, a rounded grain, a metamorphic grain and a diagenetic or chemically smooth grain. And that's the first order of classification. We then move down to a second order, which deals with these di different types of environments, whether they've been in a river, whether they've been in a glacier, or, or um, under marine conditions or in desert conditions. And then the third, fourth, and fifth orders of classification really get down to the edges and the rounding and the abrasion that's gone on. And by using that five order of classification, we can identify 67 different quartz grain types or classification. So that's that's the geology of it. Um, but when we apply it to forensics, it does start getting a little bit more complicated. And that's generally because when we've got footwear or vehicles involved, we're dealing with both, we're dealing with samples that have got multiple provenances from before the crime, pre-crime, sin crime, during the crime event itself, and then post-crime. So we're often having at least three, four, maybe more different sources of material on a particular piece of footwear. So that's where um, the complexity comes in, and that's where the experimental work that we did came in, because we were hoping that if we can begin to understand that complexity better, then we can interpretate, interpret the 
the soils and sediment evidence that we're collecting much better and be able to give more robust interpretations of it. So the first study that we looked at dealt with um, soils and sediments on, a f on footwear over time. Um, this was a, a trainer shoe that we used and we had this one pair of shoes worn over a period of four and a half months. And at each point, um, after it had been to a, a new location, we took a, s a, a spot sample from one of those locations on the sole, and we took comparative samples from the locations that were visited. And you can see here, these are the five different locations that were visited over that four and a half month period. Um, we started off in Oxford, and it's worth saying at this point, there are in, in most natural locations, there are two or three different quartz grain types present. Um, and this diagram just shows you the most distinctive grain that was characteristic of that location. So in Oxford, we had um, um, this particular grain here, which is a semi-angular, semi-rounded grain, which had quite a bit of diagenetic smoothing on it and these conchoidal breakages, which was quite distinctive. The second location that was visited in that period was um, London, um, further south in, in the United Kingdom. And you can see here that the grain is still um, semi-angular, semi-rounded. But what was interesting here was that we had an awful lot of um, chemical so solution on the surfaces, which made that one distinctive. Um, we then ventured a little further afield to southern Spain, and the particularly significant grain there was this very, very rounded grain, which is very indicative of a marine environment. Back to the UK, um, southeast corner, um, Ramsgate was the particular location there, and we've got this semi-rounded grain, and it's got extensive solution across the surfaces that was derived from a different means to the London one. And then France, Western France, was the final location, and you can see there, I hope, a very distinctive grain, polycrystalline, an awful lot of euhedral crystals and terminations on it, so that was a very easy one to spot. And broadly, what we found was... Um, I hope you can see, oh, it's just missed off the edge, but basically number of particles on the left and number of those across the bottom. And the different colours represent the different locations. Broadly, I hope you can see that um, each quartz type was present on the shoe um, after it had visited that location. Um, the green one is, I hope, relatively easy to see. Introduced on day 70, disappeared by day 87. Broadly speaking, um, there was a range between 5 and 13 days of how quickly these grains fell off the, the soles of the shoes. Um, on average, it was about 8.9 days that the grains lasted on the shoes. What's also quite interesting is that locations 1 and 2, so Oxford and London, were visited more frequently, whereas the um, location 3, 4 and 5, which was um, Spain, Ramsgate and France, were only visited once. And you can see that that's reflected in the presence and absence along this graph. So the blue was Oxford. You can see an initial um, addition here and a drop-off. And then you can see a subsequent addition on a second trip here. And similar pattern on the left and on the right shoe. What's very interesting about this is it illustrates the existence of these multiple provenances on the shoe at the same time, which um, I'm sure everybody knows about but it was very helpful to see um, the results in that way. The other interesting thing that we identified during this experiment was that when we were taking samples from the shoes, it became very apparent that we weren't able to really ascertain the sequential nature of those samples. So we weren't able to identify which quartz grains had been, had been transferred first and which ones had been transferred last. Um, so really compounding this idea of the real mixture of different provenances going on on a shoe. The really exciting bit that I, I thought um, came out of this work was um, surprisingly not what we were initially looking for, and that's often the way, isn't it, when you're doing experimental work. The blue um, bars are what's on the inside of the shoe, and the red bars are what was found on the outside of the shoe right at the end of the experiment. And basically, I hope you can see there that we're not quite sure why location four lasted on the left shoe 
and didn't on the right shoe and why location five was present on the right shoe and not on the left shoe. But those are the last two locations visited. Um, what we wonder about this is that perhaps the best way to find the history of a shoe in terms of the soils and sediments is to actually look inside the shoe. Um, taking the inner out and collecting all the material that's inside the shoe because we can see every single location was represented after a four and a half month period inside when a lot of the material had been lost from the outside of the shoe. So that was the temporal aspect. Um, the second experiment looked at more spatial considerations. So actually just what was happening on the sole of a shoe and whether there were differences in different parts of that shoe. And you can see we had two pairs of shoes and we had a three location um, experiment and we did that twice. So we had four runs because two pairs of shoes twice, eight shoes in the experiment altogether. So um, these, these are the, the locations in the U UK again. And you can see we, we started up here on a beach location in the northwest of, of England, um, a wooded location, which was deemed to be the crime event itself, and then the post-crime event location down here, down in Oxford. Um, all three locations chosen because of their popularity with people and also their ability, the middle one in particular, to be a, a, a potential place to dig a grave and um, dispose of things that maybe people wished they hadn't got. So um, we found in these three locations, um, again, we had distinctive quartz grain types. Um, in the first location, we had a very distinctive beach marine grain, very, very rounded, and you can't see this, the, the, the real surfaces there, but lots and lots of um, subaqueous indenters on that surface. The second location, you can see quite different, much more angular. And again, we've got these usual crystal terminations present. And then in the last location, which was in Oxford, we had two distinctive grains. One was more subangular, subround, whereas the other was more rounded. And um, this grain type here, type three, was very indicative of woodland areas. It had very, um, very distinctive etched, chemically etched algal filaments on the, on the surface of the grains, which made it very, very distinctive, whereas the rounded one um, had a distinctive chemical solution on it. So these three locations were visited and samples were taken from each shoe from different parts along the surface and that's um, taken from Hesket et al. And broadly speaking, you can see here, here are the um, a sort of, this is taken from the toe area, but what we found was, so type one was the very first location, the marine location, the pre-crime location. And at the end of the experiment, 13% um, broadly were from type one. Type two had a very small amount present, 1%. And then type three and type four, which was the last location visited, represented the bulk of what was retained on that footwear. And this is a composite of all the runs and all the shoes to give you an overview of what we were seeing in terms of the spatial distribution across the sole of the shoe. Broadly speaking, you can see we've got very, very similar patterns all the way across the shoe, which we were quite surprised by. We thought that there might well be some differences between the toe and the heel, with perhaps the middle section, where there's less pressure being exerted, more sequential preservation of the layers, perhaps. So we've got um, the ma vast majority of the, of the material being from the last site visited, so the, the yellow and the, and the sort of green color, but about 80% of the material across the whole shoe was, was the last location. That's not rocket science. What was really interesting was that the rest of it was generally the very first location visited, and that crime location, which was the second location, which is the, the dark red, was generally very, very sparsely present. Um, it ranged from about sort of 0% to 5% of the total sediment recovered. So that really highlights that um, we've got a, some interesting things going on here. First of all, we need to be able to identify multiple, sam multiple provenances when we are doing the analysis on, on soils and sediments on footwear. But also, we need to be using techniques that can identify these very, very small amounts um, that are present 
I guess it also perhaps means that just because we can't find it doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't there at some point. Um, but obviously, there's a whole lot more to do to understand what's happening, the interactions between those layers. We did a bit of a previous study on this using proxy sediment, and there it seemed we got the same sort of results, which was quite interesting. And there it seemed to be that the first layer and the third layer were squeezing out the second layer. So perhaps that's what's going on here. But again, knowing that that's what's happening, very, very interesting and helpful for interpreting, interpreting soils and sediments that we recover accurately. So hopefully I've um, illustrated that we've got an, an awful lot of complexity going on. And that complexity has massive implications for the way that we go about understanding what we're analyzing scientifically. And we need to be aware not only for our sampling procedures and our um, analysis procedures, but for that interpretation phase. And I really think, particularly in the UK, we're facing real challenges to demonstrate that the way we interpret things is robust, it is scientific, and it does stand s against scrutiny, particularly with perhaps new ad admissibility procedures coming through that will dictate what can be made available in a court for consideration by a jury. So I thought I would just very briefly finish with a little bit of a plug, because this is such a big area um, that we're really facing at the moment. And um, this is the center at UCL, University College London, that I'm heading up, which is really designed to be doing more of this, to be doing good, excellent science that can provide a good, robust framework and foundation for the forensic sciences, and we're wanting to do it um, across lots of different disciplines in the academic sphere, but also in collaboration with those that are actually doing forensic science so that we're actually addressing problems that are actually there rather than ones that just take our fancy. So do check out the website, and if you would like to be involved, it would be great to hear from you. Thanks very much.